Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome. My name is Dr. Carlos Kevin Blanton, and I'm a professor of history at Texas A&M University, and I'm the department head there. Uh, I am here today to uh, have a book conversation with Phyllis Barragan Gates. Uh, we're talking about her recent book, and I'm going to hold it right up here just so you can see it, which you can't see with my virtual background, but that's okay. Because if you could see it, it would say Reading and Writing and Revolution, Escuelitas and the Emergence of a Mexican-American Identity in Texas. It was just published this year by the University of Texas Press. Uh, and I'm familiar with the book. Uh, 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 and I'm familiar with Phyllis. And uh, I'm really excited to be here to talk a little bit about her book and to kind of tease out some of the ideas that I thought were pretty interesting about it and, and, and really groundbreaking uh, in terms of the field of Mexican-American or Chicano history. Uh, and I wanted to share those with you uh, today. So, hi, Phyllis. How are you? I'm doing well. How are Excellent. you, Carlos? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I like your virtual background. You have the San Francisco Bay in front of you. Thank you. I like yours. I think I have the, the, the Northern Lights, I think. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I decided to go for something groovy and trippy, but I think <laughs> it just turns out awkward, as I learned when I tried to hold up your book. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> well, I have a series of questions uh, that I'd like to ask you. Uh, and just so everyone knows, I've given an, uh, sort of an indication to Phyllis of the kind of questions that I'm going to be asking. And... Uh, uh, so what's going to happen today is just kind of a conversation about her book. Uh, but I wanted to begin with uh, my first question, uh, which is to say that Esquilitas Phyllis, uh, as you well know, uh, in the field of Mexican-American education history, were a very big unknown. Uh, it, was a, it was everyone knew about them. Everyone knew that they existed. Everyone knew them by reputation. But no one knew anything about them, their curriculum, their teachers, their students, uh, the way the school day worked, uh, until your work has come along. Talk to us about your journey in identifying this large unknown and how you went about exploring it in uh, reading, writing, and revolution. Yeah, so um, when I was a doctoral student, um, I took a class with um, Dr. Julia Mickenberg, who ended up being my dissertation advisor. And so the class was called Feminism, Modernism, and Radicalism. Um, and so for the seminar paper that I was researching for that class, I wanted to try to uncover or get at how um, those movements, feminism, modernism, and radicalism played out on the Texas-Mexico border in the early 20th century. And um, so in my research, I came across a woman named Toby Teidar and I started researching and translating her articles in her family's newspaper called La Cronica. And I came across some articles that, um, where she had laid out some solutions for educating ethnic Mexican children, right? Talking about um, how ethnic Mexican communities in Laredo, where she was from, where she was living at the time, uh, were not being well served by the uh, public school system. And so she proposed that her community should come together to build a schoolhouse and to hire a teacher that was trained in Mexico and um, that the curriculum should be one that taught their children Mexican history, Mexican culture, um, and to keep those things alive with the younger generation. Um, and she also advocated bilingual education, right? That children should be fluent in English and in Spanish. And at the time I thought, and even now, <laughs> it's not just at the time, but I thought what a radical idea, right? This community-based approach to education. Um, and especially in this era, so I should say that uh, these articles were written between 1910 and 1920, right? So it's before women had the right to vote, it's right in the midst of the Mexican revolution, um, in the midst of uh, the progressive education movement in Texas and modernization and modernity and all of these things are playing out at the same time when Joviti Dad was writing these articles, right? Um, and so the Escuelitas though, ended up being just a small part of the seminar paper that I wrote for the class. The paper was really about Joviti Dad as a prism for getting at or understanding women's activism on the Texas-Mexico border in the 
early part of the 20th century. Um, and in fact, that paper was the very, very first draft of what was chapter three in the book or what is chapter three in the book. Um, but when it came time to narrowing down a dissertation topic, I kept going back to that paper, but even more specifically, I kept going back to this idea of escuelitas, right? To these little schools. I was completely fascinated by them. Um, so as I began working on putting together a prospectus, I quickly found that, as you said a moment ago, that escuelitas were widely known about, that several historians um, had written about them, historians of ethnic Mexican educational history, um, had mentioned them in their work, had used them as evidence for um, Mexican Americans really valuing education, um, really valuing their language and their culture. Um, and when I started my preliminary research, I found that they were mentioned fairly frequently in the historical record. Um, I came across several people who were still alive, who had attended them when they were children. Um, and also I learned that my great grandmother who was from Eagle Pass, had attended one when she was a child, um, and that when she grew up, was married, and had children of her own, that she created her own escuelita when my grandmother was young, her daughter um, was young, so that way she could ensure that her children had Spanish literacy skills. Um, but beyond that, at that time, I could tell, I could see right then that there was no a real archival collection that was devoted to them. They weren't really well documented in archives anywhere. Um, so in terms of evidence, the big kind of shining moment for me um, was when I found articles in the Spanish language press, documents in the Mexican embassy's archive in Mexico City, uh, Texas superintendents reports, some uh, genealogical research that I had done, oral history interviews, and um, private family collections, particularly that of the late Rosa Lidia Vasquez Peña, who was a second generation graduate of El Colegio Altamirano. Mm. Mm. It's, uh, it, it is fascinating that that journey that you took, because it sounds like you're saying that it really began with the primary documents. It began with that first, and then you kind of discovered the, the larger kind of uh, uh, field of which there was very little. Yeah, for sure. I mean, thinking about Jovita Idar's articles that she wrote for her family's newspaper, um, she talks about several issues, right? Not just about education. Education is just one of the many issues that she was um, focused on. Um, but yet, and so that's really what my paper was about. But yet when it came time to choosing that dissertation topic, I kept going back to those schools, right? Thinking about what is she talking about? She's, she's talking about it as if everybody knows about it, but what is it? Yeah. <laughs> what right. is she talking about? I like the idea though, that it all goes back to a seminar paper yeah. in, in grad school, right? I mean, this is, this is something that every graduate student should know about is that that's why you take your seminars very seriously. And that's why you take your papers very seriously. You never know what's going to come out of it. I mean, uh, no, that's fascinating. How, how, how do you think that this work crosses not just disciplinary lines, but also field and subfield lines uh, in reading, writing, and revolution? So one of the things that I argue um, about in the book is that to fully understand the significance of escuelitas, that you have to take them out of a vacuum and you have to put them in the appropriate context without any limiting factors, right? Disciplinary or otherwise. Um, so one of the things that I found was that escuelitas both impacted and were impacted by um, things like place, gender, age, nationality, language, and of course, time. Uh, right, the era in which they existed. Um, so for example, many Escolita teachers were women, right? They were educated, they were independent, um, concerned with the future of their communities. So one could very well study Escolitas from a women and gender studies perspective and the analysis would be quite rich, right? To be sure, but it still leaves out a lot of other contributing elements to their existence. And I think the same goes for uh, thinking about escuelitas from a border studies or even a childhood studies perspective, right? 
that I don't think they you can fit them into any one discipline or sub-discipline. Especially, I think, um, because as you mentioned before, they have, have not really fully been studied in the past. And so um, part of what I felt in, you know, sort of this kind of professional responsibility in undertaking the work, the book that I did, was trying to uncover about as much about their existence as I possibly could. And that's one of the reasons too why um, the book is solely focused on Texas as opposed to the entire Southwest because Escuelitas did exist in, in um, other states in the Southwest. Right, right. So really it's the lack of knowledge that kind of forced you into a more, uh, the lack of secondary knowledge that forced you into more a more, really a more interdisciplinary kind of approach to try to figure out as much as you possibly could about these schools. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, even just thinking about methodologies of social history, right, where you're, you think about problem-oriented history where you have a, a question or a problem that you pose and then you think, where can I go to find the answer to this? And oftentimes for this project, the answer was not the archives. Right. It was um, oral histories or private collections or um, articles in the Spanish language press or uh, things like that to, to try to get at the answer. Like what were Escuelitas? What did they mean? Why did they last so long? Um, it's funny how some of sometimes in, in social history, the things that oftentimes matter most to people are oftentimes the things that go unspoken or unwritten of, because there's very little debate. Everyone understands that education is important and everyone understands that, you know, uh, clearly it has to work this way. Uh, but 50, 100 years later, what that way is or what those conditions were might not be fully appreciated. Uh, and since people didn't necessarily spend a lot of time debating it with one another, you know, it might get lost to time. And, and I wonder if that, if the Esquilly does kind of fell into that. It just seems so obvious and commonsensical that people didn't talk about it that much. Yeah, and you kind of see that in the documents too, right? So in 1910, the Mexican consulate conducted this investigation into the state of education for ethnic Mexican children in Texas. Um, it was not a very well thought out investigation <laughs> at all, to put, to put it mildly. I mean, they, they asked the, the Mexican consul in Laredo to, um, to investigate this. And so he, he did an investigation for the three counties that, you know, for which he was responsible like under his, within his district, which were all located on the U.S.-Mexico border and um, had, you know, majority populations of ethnic Mexicans. And so he said, yeah, I, I don't see any, there aren't any issues here. So then the Mexican consulate turns around and says, there are no issues in the entire state of Texas regarding um, the segregation of, of Mexican children. And so the Idar family, I, I just talked about them with Jovita Idar. Um, she, it was her family and they were the ones who owned and published La Cronica. Um, you know, they're outraged by this. And even in, in and her brother, Clemente, that writes a series of articles kind of chronicling this investigation. And then um, when they close the investigation, writing all of these articles, speaking out about how the Mexican consulate needs to reopen this investigation. But even in one of these articles, he says, um, I could take you to any number of, of um, Mexican schools, right? Mexican private schools where the teachers are educated and have degrees and certificates from Mexico and they come to the United States and they teach in these schools. But he says it just in passing. You know, it's, it's, it's exactly what you were talking about, right? Like he was completely taking uh, for granted the fact that his audience, his readership was going to know exactly what he was talking about. And there's lots of indications like that, right? Like in Clemente Hidal's articles or Jovita Hidal's articles or in any number of articles in the Spanish language press um, where you know that there's this assumption of knowledge um, on behalf of the audience who's reading, who, who was reading those articles a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's always, you know, uh, 
speaking to people who've lived through a lot of history, whether it's family members or whether it's uh, uh, subjects at an oral interview, it, it always strikes me how frustrating sometimes interview subjects can be having to explain the way life was like, like, why, why don't you understand? You're a historian. Why don't you understand this? Why don't you get this? This is the way you had to crank the phone. This is the way you had to do this. And yeah, I don't know. I find very interesting the way in which you've talked about identifying a kind of reality, uh, a phenomenon, mm -hmm. but then because you don't necessarily have people speaking about it at length because it's such an obvious common sense aspect of their daily lives, it does require that we read sources against the grain. Uh, sometimes it requires that we we use theoretical insights uh, uh, to allow us to envision what we're seeing in a different way. And I think this is sort of how theory can really help. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your theoretical approach and just to give everyone who's listening a bit of context. Uh, one of the points that you make in the book is to, while accommodation and resistance are important uh, uh, and, and they're sort of presented in, in the field of Mexican American history or Chicano uh, history as very much kind of a binary approach. There is accommodation, there is resistance, uh, but that's sort of where most human agency falls under. Uh, and clearly you take a somewhat different perspective on that. And I was wondering uh, how you saw power and agency operating uh, in Mexican American educational history. Uh, uh, what kind of theoretical uh, uh, readings do you find insightful or perspectives do you find insightful or critical in trying to re-envision a past that's sometimes not always spelt out in the archives? Yeah, um, so two of the most um, important lenses, theoretical frameworks or lenses for me uh, to get beyond that accommodation resistance binary was um, childhood, like thinking of childhood as something that's socially constructed. So childhood and imaginary citizenship. So there have been several scholars in childhood studies who have written about um, or defining and thinking about childhood as a vehicle for no normalizing social and cultural structures, right? Like if you grow up to some with something, it feels very normal to you and you don't really question it. Um, and then also thinking about the framework of imaginary citizenship. So that was something that um, childhood, like a children's literature critic and scholar named Courtney Weekle Mills um, wrote about in her book um, called Imaginary Citizens. So imaginary citizenship, thinking about that as a framework um, for understanding how children have the power to ratify national narratives, right? That nation states present themselves to children and they reveal what they expect of future citizens, how they expect children to act and behave, right? Via the school curriculum uh, and books. And so these were, that was my conceptual starting point. Um, but what I did for in my research was looking at it from the other side, right? So if childhood is a way to make things feel normal, then it can also be a vehicle for communities to counter what they want to call out as not being normal, right? So creating and maintaining escuelitas and teaching their children Spanish literacy, Mexican history and cultural traditions. So all of this directly countered the progressive education movement in Texas. Um, and so thinking about then childhood as a meeting ground for the current difficulties and issues that adults are facing, um, but also the solution that adults decide to enact um, to either solve the problem or to prevent it from continuing to be a problem in the future. Um, and so I took those frameworks and started thinking about racialized childhoods. Um, which I do agree with Natalia Molina's, you know, book are relational, um, especially when you're thinking about segregated schooling, uh, how race is constructed around and imposed upon children, um, and how segregated segregated schooling creates these connections between racialized childhoods, even as it seeks to separate children. 
And these racialized childhoods in separate schools and escuelitas don't fit into that accommodation resistance dichotomy, right? So I interpret educational history, especially as it pertains to escuelitas, as residing in that gray area between accommodation and resistance, right? That sometimes it's one, sometimes it's accommodation, sometimes it's resistance, sometimes it's both, but it's always negotiation. Mm. Yeah, I, I find that very, uh, uh, th very insightful. I think that uh, emphasizing negotiation, it, it is, uh, it is very much about ways in which power can can look very different. But it's also ways of reconciling the fact that many times people with agency don't necessarily act in a way that we think people with agency could or should act in that place and time, but understanding uh, the strategies necessary for survival in that period in time, I think it's very clear that, that uh, there's a wide spectrum of negotiations that people who are denied access to power make with people who have power in order to better their conditions. And if, when seen through that lens, I agree that I think that it is relational uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, but it's also, uh, it's more than just sort of a, almost like a mathematical formula where X and Y have this relational, you know, Z component to it. And it's, and Z is always sort of floating. Uh, but here, I think focusing uh, on aspirational citizenship and imagined citizenship and uh, a childhood as a vehicle, uh, you can see how these can be read, these escuelitas can be read as in-your-face protests right. to Jim Crow and everything associated with Jim Crow. Uh, but done in a way that if you're advocating on behalf of your kids and getting them a better education, yeah, it runs contrary to Jim Crow, but it's not necessarily seen in that light by people who have an exercise power. And, and I should note that this gets back to the work of um, uh, the Refusing to Forget team and several really groundbreaking scholars in Chicano, uh, uh, Chicano history in Texas. But the 19 teens, when this is happening, this is the site of incredible violence. Uh, this is the time of La Matanza in South Texas, in which hundreds, if not thousands, of people were murdered uh, on the Rio Grande Valley, just all over the border in, along, between Texas and Mexico uh, in the 19 teens, uh, based on nothing more than fear and suspicion. Uh, so yeah, the, these escuelitas can be seen as not just what they are, which are schools, but they're more than that too, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're definitely a form of resistance. Absolutely. Um, a form of, you know, Guadalupe San Miguel has characterized them as a form of cultural maintenance. I, can, I very much agree with that, right? They're, mm. But I think they're all of the above. They're, right. they're functioning in multiple ways simultaneously. Right, right, and and from from different people that you locate within uh, the Escuelita movement, um, it, it can be more on one side, the resistance side, more on the accommodation side. But at the end of the day, if it's if it's both, it also means that it's this larger issue of negotiation uh, and the relational, I think, over necessarily this binary model. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think education in general um, functions that way, right? Like it can be oppressive and it can be um, uplifting. And, and um, oftentimes you find these different populations who are sending their children to public schools, sending them to um, escuelitas, they're asserting agency in all of these decisions that they make, whether it's, uh, you know, accommodation is a form of asserting agency, right? Um, it doesn't mean you're without agency. You're making a choice to act um, to to act a certain way, um, and I think Escuelitas really highlights the the range of of different ways that ethnic Mexicans asserted agency to negotiate their place in the United States.
No, like like I said, I found I agree with you, and I found the uh, uh, the theoretical positioning uh, that you have in this work uh, uh, really I think plugged in to lots of other fields and what's happening in in, in history, uh, and just you know it it moves us that much farther away from these old, very very sort of traditional ideas, very top down, bottom up kind of models of. Uh, it's the class struggle and it's only the class struggle, but clearly there are negotiations and there's, there's culture as a, an issue that's uh, really important and that is different in different situations, in different locales and in di among different people. Uh, but in a way you found a way, uh, an umbrella organizing concept, I think, to kind of unite that disparateness into uh, a larger system. So I really appreciated that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and just to, and this kind of goes back to an earlier question that you stated, but even just thinking about gender, right? Thinking about women yeah. who um, founded and sustained their own Escuelitas. One of, um, you know, a friend and, and colleague of Jovitidad, her name was Maria Renteria. She um, maintained her own Escuelita, but she also published articles in La Cronica about women's history um, in Mexico. And uh, there was even a, an article in La Cronica talking about how these women had gotten together and Maria Renteria gave a presentation about her research to um, these other women who were also Escuelita teachers in Laredo. Um, so even, you know, moving beyond the class tr struggle um, as it pertains to Escuelitas, there's this whole dimension of, of uh, gender. Right yeah. and, and women's roles um, yeah. in these larger civil rights movements that you see Im embedded in educational history. That's that's actually a really good segue for uh, the next question that I had. Um, we live at a time. It's 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 I guess this recording theoretically could last for a very long time. Uh, I'm assuming people will get to it. Uh, relatively soon after it was made. It's currently November 30th uh, in the afternoon. Uh, so we're only a few weeks out from the 2020 presidential election. Uh, so of course I had to I had to bring it to the presidential election here. We, we live at a time in which the Latino vote is being discussed widely by political commentators. People are trying to figure it out. You know, what does what, does what happened in Dade County have in common with what happens in the Rio Grande Valley with what happens in uh, Pimal County, uh, Arizona, or Los Angeles County, uh, uh, or Cook County in Illinois? Um, so there's a lot of discussion about, about Latinos. So it's part of the ether right now. Uh, one, of the, one of the discussion points was this, this argument that the, the, terms, the, 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 the terms of identity that are used in academic circles, uh, Latinx, for example, uh, perhaps are out of step with Latino communities who don't necessarily, you know, as we've seen in 2020, don't always necessarily uh, support either the term or, or those who would try to create a pan Latino kind of ethos. Uh, but at the same token, there are other uh, commentators who are talking about needing to take very seriously uh, different ideological voices within the Latino community, uh, whether they're conservative voices or radical voices, uh, whatever they may be. Uh, maybe nonpartisan voices, right? So the question that I had was, I find education really, really central to uh, uh, all Latino history, particularly Mexican American education history. And I'm going to focus on Mexican American history because that's that's my emphasis. That's your emphasis as well. Uh, I I feel that let education within the Mexican American community cuts across time, it cuts across place, it cuts across ideology, whether you're a liberal or a conservative or a radical or a revolutionary, uh, education becomes that one category that seems to unite everyone, in some cases more than class, more than ideology, more than, more than uh, sort of regional uh, ethnic identity. 
Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the centrality of education in Mexican American history, but also in Mexican American communities today. Yeah. Um, so I want to start by saying, and this is something that you kind of just said, but I'd like to reiterate is that our society values education, right? And sees it as, um, especially public education, as a vehicle for attaining the American dream. But, you know, the reality is that we have countless students of color in low income schools with few opportunities to really take full advantage of that supposed pathway to the American dream, right? And many interpret our current state of affairs in a vacuum, when in fact, the system was designed this way uh, from the earliest days of the public school system in Texas. And I'm not reading between the lines here or you know, doing any sort of theoretical somersaults to interpret the silences of the archives. Um, you, I know you're familiar with these with these materials as well from um, from your book, Right Strange Career, Bilingual Education in Texas, that superintendents in the late 19th century made their views unequivocally clear about what they thought of ethnic Mexican children and their families. And these views, which were quite widespread, impacted perceptions of ethnic Mexicans as students, as workers, parents, citizens, um, as communities, and as individuals, right? And so what what we see today is we are living with that legacy, right? We're of, of that very problematic legacy, I should add. Um, and so I think that because of all of this, Mexican American and ethnic Mexican Latinx education history is essential to understanding Mexican American history because these educational spaces are multidimensional sites where these opposing forces exist simultaneously. And this is something that we've talked about earlier, right? That schools are sites of oppression. They're sites of, um, of empowerment, of negotiation, of identity formation. So the way that education functions in our society is way more and far greater than simply just a pathway to the American dream. Um, and so everyone, no matter, because of this then, everyone, no matter which political party you belong to, agrees that education is important. Um, but they don't agree on the various components that come together to create educational spaces like curriculum, right, or overall objectives. And you see, you see this in Escuelita history as well. Um, so Jovita Gonzalez, for example, she wrote about Escuelitas in her 1930 master's thesis um, in which she stated that the Escuelitas of South Texas in the 1920s, right, were organized and maintained by Mexican conservatives because they tried to instill traditional Mexican values in those students. And we were just talking about you and me, right? We were just talking about how in that era, the mere existence of Escuelitas could be interpreted quite easily okay. as something very radical, right? As a, as a form of resistance based on what was taking place in the United States um, with, or even in Texas, right? With La Matanza and the progressive education movement, um, modernization, modernity, all of these things, right? That the, the fact that Escuelitas existed and were thriving in the 1920s is a sign of resistance. But in 1930, when Jovita Gonzalez finished writing her thesis, right, for her at that moment, while she was celebrating them, if you read her thesis, I, the way I interpret it is that she's very much celebrating them, but she's also recognizing that the reason why those schools existed was because of the, the needs or the wants of a, a conservative population, right? Who was, was trying to keep traditional Mexican values alive. Um, so again, American society, um, Escuelitas of the 1920s, pretty radical, but yet at the same time could be conservative, right? Um, or even thinking about the post-World War II era when Escuelitas go sharply into decline um, you have Mexican American liberal activists who want to integrate the public school curriculum to make it more inclusive, to make it more reflective of the population. And one of the arguments that I make in the book is that 
um, these Mexican liberal activists, Mexican American liberal activists, many of them, not all of them, but many of them attended escuelitas when they were children. Um, and so they were taking that curriculum that they had been exposed to in their childhoods and trying to integrate parts of it into the master narrative, so to speak, that was being taught in the public school system, right? Trying to change the system to make it more inclusive. Um, but then you also have uh, Mexican American conservative activists who are also drawing from the Escuelita model, right? But they're not doing it to challenge or question or change the system, but to prepare Mexican American children to be ready to enter the system, right? So they're creating these alternative educational spaces outside the public school system to teach Mexican American children English or 400 English words or 500 English words by the time they start the first grade. So just as much as you have in the present, these discussions of, you know, Mexican Americans, not a monolithic community. Um, why, why are some of them voting uh, for the Republican Party and then others are voting for the Democratic Party? It's, I mean, you could say at any given point in time in history, um, ethnic Mexicans have never been a monolithic community. Yeah, yeah. And yet, in, in, in even in the 1960s, the, the Huelga schools uh, of the late 60s and early 70s, the strike schools, uh, mm -hmm. were seen as examples of the cultural left. <laughs> not, not conservatives at all, but the far cultural left wanting to withdraw their children from the public schools that they believe were racist to institute a very Chicano-centric sense of history, of identity, of a community of language. So right, left, radical, a transitional, you know, provisional, temporary, permanent. It's, uh, uh, it seems to span the ideological, ideological and motivational kind of spectrum. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and even as we pointed out, you could take, you know, one thing at one given point in time and make the argument that it's reflective of a conservative leaning or it's reflective of a more leftist radical leaning, right? No, 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 no it's, uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating phenomenon. We still, we're still trying to uh, uh, understand Escuelitas uh, across the country. I think we have probably, as a result of your work, we have a much better understanding of them in Texas. Uh, now than we do in California, in Arizona, in New Mexico, in Colorado, anywhere else in the Southwest where we know that they existed. Uh, Thank you. Well, no, salute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you, uh, what's, uh, what's next for you in terms of uh, expanding from uh, reading, writing, and revolution? Uh, I'm thinking back to your seminar paper from graduate school, and I'm wondering if that's going to provide the answer to this question. Um, you know, yes and no. So I have, um, I've started doing preliminary research in creating a digital humanities project based mm -hmm. on, that draws from the research of the book, Reading, Writing, and Revolution, because um, the, the book has a map. Um, that documents all of the locations that I found of Escuelitas, right? Whether in, it's a, you know, a historic newspaper article or an oral history interview or an archival document or something like that, right? Uh, it documents those locations. Um, but what I envision for this digital humanities project is a map that's more interactive. So if you were to scroll the cursor and other, this is, other uh, digital humanities projects have done a very similar model. But if you put the cursor over um, a particular city like Laredo, for example, there would be a drop down menu of um, like a list of all of the documents that have cited Laredo. And then it would give um, the reader a, a more perspective on the kind of like the depth of Escuelita history in that particular location. Because when you see the map, the printed map, it's very static. You know, there's a dot on each city and you think, okay, 
there's uh, a dot on Laredo, but there was a superintendent's report, uh, I think it was 1892, if I remember correctly, where the superintendent of the Laredo School District wrote um, in, his, in his remarks, um, he said something like, well, our attendance for the public school system is low, but it's because about half of the Mexican children who live in the city attend these Spanish language schools and there's about 40 of them. So to think there were 40 escuelitas in the city of Laredo in 1892, right? You don't really get that full picture with just the dot on the map. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, that's one. And then the other, my, I've already started thinking about my second book project, which is um, a biography of Jovita Gonzalez, who was a um, historian, um, a folklorist, right? A, a writer, uh, a teacher, and, and a children's literature author, I argue. Um, but to link that back to college, uh, I took a Mexican-American literature class with Jose Limon when I was a doctoral student. Ah. And so we read uh, Caballero and talked about Jovita Gonzalez extensively. One of the things um, that I found was that she was not born in 1904, as many people have um, argued. And the reason why they say that is because basically that's what she said. So <laughs> everybody's taking her word for it, right? Uh, but I found that she was actually born in 1897. And so it all started, I told you I was introduced to Jovita Gonzalez and Jose Limon's class. Um, and like many other scholars, I read her thesis very carefully. Um, especially the parts pertaining to women and the parts pertaining to education and escuelitas. Um, and then in her very short autobiography, she wrote that she attended an escuelita and that her father taught at an escuelita. And so she also taught at a private school here in San Antonio. Uh, I'm in San Antonio right now. So here in San Antonio called St. Mary's Hall, which at the time used to be an all girls, I mean, it's still a very elite school, but now it's co-ed. At the time it was an all girls um, boarding school and she was the Spanish teacher. Um, she was the Spanish teacher there. And so I went to the school and uh, did some work in their special collections and looked at a bunch of old yearbooks and um, found some write-ups about um, her and her Spanish class. And she um, helped start a Spanish club there at the school and thinking about how do you get from an escuelita being, you know, attending an escuelita and having your father be quite invested in Mexican culture and traditions and things like that and, and in, in touch with the Mexican consulate um, to your 1930 master's thesis to what I am seeing as your curriculum um, by the time you got to the early 1930s and she was teaching at uh, St. Mary's Hall and then she moved to Corpus and spent the rest of her career uh, teaching in the public school system in Corpus Christi. And just thinking about the evolution of her, her pedagogical approach and how the difference uh, of seven years of the changing of her birthday made a huge difference in my interpretation um, of her as a historian of Escuelitas in a sense, right? Um, a student of them and a, and a historian of them. And then um, uh, in, in some ways, a pedagogical theorist about how to integrate their curriculum into uh, the public school system and, and what Spanish literacy skills could do for race relations between Anglos and Mexicans in Texas, right? So doing all of that research and then writing the, the the portion of the book in chapter five that deals with Jovita Gonzalez um, and just becoming so fascinated with her. Mm. And so thinking about how to put all of those components together to do the second book project, that's where I'm at right now. It's very exciting for me to hear that because I've been waiting for someone to put everything together in one volume uh, on Jovita Gonzalez, because I'm, I'm always curious. I want to learn more. Uh, and she seems such a peripatetic kind of figure. She's just, 
on the margins of every major issue. You know, she's she's involved in every major issue, seemingly. Uh, whether it goes to the, to the revolutionary era, the turn of the century, the pre-revolutionary era, the revolutionary era, the more conservative era in the 1940s and 50s, she's a part of it all. And she's a literary figure and she's she's an amazing person. And clearly she wrote one of, if not the most important master's thesis on Chicano history ever, uh, which, which everyone should know and read. Um, yeah, I, com- I completely agree. Her uh, master's thesis is, and you know, it's, it, and as you know, it's been published and Maria Cotera edited it and wrote the introduction. And it's one of my favorite books of all time. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, on that note, one of my favorite books uh, of late has been Reading, Writing, and Revolution. And I think, so it's, much. I think it's one of the most innovative books that I've read in Chicano history in a long time. And uh, Phyllis, I'd like to congratulate you on its publication. And I hope uh, your colleagues and your students and anyone else who happens to be listening will pick it up and read it because it's really an outstanding contribution. Uh, to not just Chicano educational history, but to Texas educational history and Southwestern borderlands educational history. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you.